In step four, we delineate the regions of rejection and non-rejection of the null hypothesis. So thinking in terms of confidence interval, we can use the confidence interval to define a range of values that lead us not to reject the null hypothesis if our test statistic is within that range. So we obtain a test statistic in the range of values outside the confidence interval if we obtain a test statistic outside the confidence interval, which is going to be called the zone of rejection, that's going to lead us to reject the null hypothesis. We are going to have critical values as the cutoff points that define the start, the start and the end of the zones of rejection and acceptance. And the critical values and zones are given in the same standardized units as the test statistic. So the critical values are going to be z-scores or t-scores, depending on whether or not we're using the normal distribution or the t-distribution. Let's see what this looks like graphically. Suppose we have a two-tailed test. This figure over here is for a two-tailed test. In this case, the alternative hypothesis is that mu, the population mean, is not equal to c. Earlier, I was using the notation mu sub h. Now I'm just saying that this thing is c. Same idea. OK, suppose we, um, uh, this is the sampling distribution that we're drawing here. The sampling distribution is going to be centered on this C. So it's centered on this C. And we are going to have a confidence interval from here to here. And that the width of this confidence interval is going to be determined by alpha, the level of significance. In particular, in a two-tailed test, we are going to place alpha over 2, that much probability, alpha over 2 in each of the two tails. So the total amount of area outside of the confidence interval, in this case, is equal to alpha. But because it's a two-tailed test, we're going to put half of that area to the left and half of that area to the right. Based on that, we know how we can find the z-score that will define these two locations. We're just simply looking for the z-scores that would put the remaining probability inside the confidence interval here. Now, suppose that uh, the null hypothesis is, uh, let's suppose that the null hypothesis is true. In that case, when we go out and we collect a sample mean, an x-bar, it's more likely that the x bar that we collect is going to be something similar to c. So it's more likely that this x bar that we collect is going to be here in the middle of the distribution, somewhere in here. In fact, so long as the x bar that we collect is within this range from this critical value to this critical value, so long as the x bar is in this range, then we are going to say that it's it's quite likely that the null hypothesis is true. We're not going to reject the null hypothesis. Recall that the null hypothesis in this case is that mu equals c. So if we go out and collect an x-bar that's close to c, well, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis. But if we go out and collect an x-bar that's outside of this zone of acceptance, if it's beyond these critical values, it's in the zone of rejection. And therefore, that's going to lead us to reject the null hypothesis that the population mean is equal to c. The probability of obtaining a value, let me erase everything that we have so far. Let's put it this way. The probab if the null hypothesis is true, if mu equals c, then the probability of obtaining a sample mean here in the tails is equal to alpha percent. So if we set alpha to say 
then the probability of obtaining a sample mean out here is really, really small if in fact the null hypothesis is true. Because if the null hypothesis is true, we're going to find a, an x bar somewhere over here, close to the center of this distribution. So the alternative is that if we find an x bar way out in these tails, in the zone of rejection, it's actually more likely that the null hypothesis is false that it's going to lead us to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. It's more likely that the alternative hypothesis is true than the null hypothesis. And that's the basic concept of how hypothesis testing works. So in this two-tailed test, if we go out and collect a green, if we go out and collect an x bar anywhere in this range, We'll accept the null hypothesis, but if we collect x bars anywhere outside of the zone of rejection or in the zone of rejection, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Now, things are a little bit different when it comes to two-tailed tests, I mean one-tailed tests. The difference with the one-tailed test is that instead of dividing the, uh, div dividing the zone of rejection into two halves, these greater than options or the left th th than option, we are only going to have one rejection region depending on the sign of the alternative hypothesis. And we're going to have the full amount of alpha, not alpha over two, we're going to have the full amount of alpha in the tail. So if, for example, alpha was 10% and we had a left tail test, then the area over here is going to have 10%. And therefore, if you wanted to find the critical value using, say, table A, we know that this area over here is going to have 40%, and we can find the z-score that forms that boundary very easily. Similarly, in the positive case, we're going to have 10% to the right, so this is going to be a positive z for 10%, and this one over here is going to be a negative z. So here's an example of, of, a, of the rejection zones all worked out. Suppose we had a two-tailed test with alpha equals to 5%. In fact, this is the uh, situation we have for our air quality example question. The question was, can the researchers be 95% confident that the air quality measures have changed? So we had a non-directional test. The alternative hypothesis, if you recall, was that mu no longer equals 30. So here we have at the center of the distribution, mu equals 30. That's going to give us a z-score of 0. So if we collect an x-bar, equals 30, then the z for that value is going to equal 30 minus 30, x bar minus mu over the standard error of the mean equals 0. So this is a z of 0. And now we want to have 5% split up into the tails. So we have 2% in each tail. And based on our table of critical values, we know that we are going to have, say, 47 and a half over here, and that z-score that we need then is 1.96, and because of the symmetry rule, the other critical value is going to be minus 1.96. So when we go out and compute our, t our z test by standardizing the x-bar that we actually received, the sample mean was actually 35, when we go out and find our z, we're going to plot that z on this curve and see if it's out here in the tails or if it's in here in the zone of acceptance.